I'm going to start by sort of asking each of our, our each panelists please just take a, a couple of minutes just to very quickly introduce themselves, but to answer two simple, at least seems simple to me, questions. Firstly, what, what current or emerging technology in banking are you personally most excited about? And secondly, more broadly, what technology in general, in more general, are you both excited about, or do you find yourself using or relying um, on a lot? And then we'll go into some of the questions of the panel. So, um, yeah, we'll start with, with you. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see what's going to happen when ATMs will become more and more of a cashless society. And I'm curious to see when that's such a huge focus in all of our businesses, how that's going to impact and what changes will happen. And when you research what other countries are doing, um, some countries are using iris recognition. So what will we do in the UK? Okay. And, a, and, a, and a particular kind of technology that um, as, a, as a user, as a consumer, you find you're using a lot in your, your life is the one you would... I do, but my son doesn't. Right. <laughs> my son uses his contactless card wherever he goes. And then on the other side, my husband doesn't like contactless. He, he prefers to use a checkbook. I didn't know people still oh, had those. <laughs> <laughs> he is the person who, I always wondered who was the one person who still <laughs> uses their checkbook. So it's your husband, that's very good. Great. Um, Claire, maybe a few next. Um, so I'm quite interested in the trends around channels. So I think when mm. you think about, you know, we went from branches to ATMs and then we have mm. apps and now, you know, people can pay for things with their watches. Um, personally, when I started mm. using Apple Pay, um, I found it really interesting. It just changed my behavior completely. I now just point my phone at everything, mm. which is which is quite interesting. And on the personal side, I think I'm very I'm very attached to the magic box. I have it here. Okay. Um, but I mean, all of the things it enables. When I was a when I was at school, I had you know, I had a Walkman, then a Discman, mm -hmm. and I now have every song I ever wanted <coughs> to listen to in my pocket, which yeah. is incredible. And also, you know, personal productivity tools around things like whether it's getting mm -hmm. my steps. Um, or being able to track banking mm. on the go, you know, the, the, the amount of things we can do now mm. um, is really incredible. And you know, what will happen next in those things? I don't know. Mm. Will I be paying for things with my iris? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, and also, it, you, you, you mentioned kind of music there, and you see the way things like Spotify then have transformed, you know, the, the economics of business model of, of music as well. So, so some lessons for banking there, there too, I think. Ed Sheeran perhaps should become a banker. I don't know. Gavin, anything for you? Um, yeah, Ed Sheeran might be a, a good addition. Um, so I think for me, um, AI hmm. and how that not only will tr transform the experience for our customers but for our staff as well. So hmm. actually thinking about how do we use some of this technology not only for our customer proposition but our staff proposition. Um, for me, um, I, I think one of the, the biggest things I rely on now is, is social media but within work. Hmm. So we have um, Workplace and Facebook at work so that allows me to to speak to my team in, in many different locations at a touch of a button and mm. actually see them at a touch of a button. So that has really revolutionized for me mm. um, speaking to teams across the globe, uh, which would have been before um, you know, difficult mm. and cumbersome. And uh, do you get fake news on Facebook at work? Or is uh, it, is it, does that thankfully not, not okay, so far. Um, I think it's one of these, these challenges, isn't uh -huh. it, which is um, you put some social media um, solutions into your workplace mm -hmm. you have to trust that people will, will behave ethically yeah. um, and I think I would uh, safe to say that I, I'm not aware of anything where we've mm -hmm. had anybody posting anything either fake or maybe yeah. uh, un unappropriate. Yeah, and I, I, and I, don't, I don't see your particular chief executive sitting there at three in the morning tweeting uh, <laughs> tweeting things so that's probably quite good yeah and Karen so uh, a kind of I think technology for me is I, I look at it from a, an individual point of view from a, a learner's point of view given the work that I'm in and I'm particularly interested to understand as people more and more become home-based in, in, in working mm -hmm. how do we reach out to those people to make sure that their development is maintained um, to make sure that they are engaged and feel included within the workplace um, so you know there is there's something about there that's about to come board to say that somebody taps into their computer to say I need I've got a need in this, and a solution come back to them straight away to say, actually, mm. you need X, Y, and Z. So that's an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, from a personal point of view, I think the one area that I am looking at at the moment is YouTube, mm. um, because I don't personally use, use YouTube as myself, but my husband does, mm. uh, which is hugely da dangerous because he's, he's, he's technophobic. But if he wants to change something on his car, like change a filter, was what he did last week, YouTube was there. But equally so does my five-year-old grandson. Mm. He's on it all of the time. 
Um, and in my eight-year-old granddaughter is on it from a school point of view. And indeed, we've started to introduce you, YouTube into some of our, our, our solutions. Mm. So I, that is what I'm watching closely, because I actually am not convinced yet mm. that YouTube is a good place to be. Okay, interesting. And um, it's a shame Magda hasn't been able to, to join us, um, but I have a good example of, of technology. A lot of us, we've talked about retail banking mostly, I think, so far. You've talked about colleagues as well. I, I saw a very good example in the, in the small business, commercial banking uh, space this summer in Poland. I was uh, just riding my bike, um, stopped at some traffic lights, looked across, and then next to me was a small car with an ATM stuck on the back of it. My first thought was, someone stole an ATM and put it on the back of a car. <laughs> then I looked a bit more closely, it had bank branding on it, um, Idea Bank, which is a, an online bank in Poland. Um, and so I was, I was quite intrigued by this, so I had a, had a little look uh, when I got home to see what was going on. And fantastic I idea. Um, uh, at least I think so. So they've they've put ATMs um, uh, um, on. Um, uh, so these are ATMs that will both um, where you can both deposit uh, cash um, and of course withdraw cash and do various other services. And there's a video terminal as well to to deal with the banker. Um, if you so you can use your mobile phone app to call the ATM to your business premises or your house or a, a Starbucks coffee shop. It'll arrive. You can do whatever you need to do, and then it drives off again. I thought, isn't that fantastic, really bringing banking, banking to you? Um, and then I, th I believe a lot of the ATMs are now on electric cars as well. It's trying to be sustainable too. I thought that was a really nice use of, of technology and something I, I hadn't seen before. I don't know, maybe it does exist in other countries, but I thought that was quite, quite interesting. Great, so now, now the difficult questions. Um, so, and we will start with the, the most kind of difficult one, really. Um, when we're talking about the future of banking in terms of, in terms of technology, um, you know, just, just how much do you think we do know about what's coming down the, the road? Um, so, you know, in five years' time, if I had to press you, you know, what are the, the key the technologies that will transform um, retail and, and, and commercial and other parts of, of banking? Um, and therefore, what are the, the skills we'll need to, to, to support that? So, Claire, could I have a question first? There's a, there's a great sentence about underestimating uh, the impact of change in the long run, but overestimating it in the short mm -hmm. run, which I think we will have seen with, you know, if anyone's bought an Alexa, you know, I was so excited of all the things we could do, and then I plugged it in, and it recognizes my voice about 50% of the time, <laughs> so, and gets what I want about 50% of the time. But that was an interesting reset mm -hmm. for me. But when I look at this, there's, there's a great photo of New York City in 1900 on Fifth Avenue, and it's got these horses clubbling along. Mm -hmm. And then there's the same photo from the same vantage point five years later, and there's two rows of hmm. Model T Ford cars driving up and down. And it's, it's really incredible to put these two things side by side and see how, in the space of five years, there's a completely huge shift in the landscape. So, um, you know, I'm really excited. Um, I'm a reformed learning and development professional. Uh, I spent two years in an innovation team, and I'm now working on a project to deploy mm. AI in a um, compliance uh, mm. environment. And it's really amazing when we look at the potential for, you know, a lot of what we're doing in banks involves sifting through false positives. You've got to look and make sure mm. it's not something to be concerned about, but you know, there's, a, there's a significant number of what analysts are looking at every day that isn't of concern. And how do we move past that? How do we validate the systems are doing things in the right way? And how do we get to a place where staff are only looking at the things that really do need their attention. So I think that's hugely enabling and, and you know, the impact that that can have across the banking sector you know, <coughs> is, is going to be something else. And you mentioned voice there at the start in terms of Alexa and um, you, know, you can't read an article on banking at the moment without everyone saying voice is the next channel, you know, next year everyone will be, it'll be voice banking. I mean, from your early comments, you expect you, that's quite a way off, do you see it then? It could be. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting dilemmas in it as well, mm. right? I mean, do you want to say to your Alexa, how much money is in my bank account? Uh, mm. And then the next day down the shop, have your kids say, but Daddy, Alexa said you had. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so there's some really interesting yeah, challenges. Interesting. But you can address that through things like percentages. You set a percentage that says 500 pounds is 100%. Mm. And when Alexa says you have 125% in your bank account, you know what that means. No mm. one else in the room knows what that means. Um, so there's some really interesting challenges you can work through and start, start thinking about. I personally would love to have the ability to voice dictate all my emails, um, mm. you know, moving from that mode of doing this mm. all day to actually talking and interacting mm. um, more so that can be more natural, so mm. have capability. Great, thank you. Yeah. We, we only looked like you wanted to come in at one point there. I'd like to eliminate my email. Oh. <laughs> 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 or get a robot to deal with it. Um, I think a lot depends on banks' abilities to leverage the power of customer insight um, and advanced analytics and the 
digital technologies that they have and be able to provide services to our tech savvy customers. I think customers at the moment in many ways are more tech savvy than us. I think that goes in age bands as well, if I'm being honest. Um, not everybody has a smartphone and a lot of the technologies we are doing are working towards capability on smart devices. So it'll be interesting to see, I think as well with um, PSD2 and the challenges that brings with bringing on third party providers, um, what that does to us and what the risks attached to that are. I don't think we'll ever lose sight of risk and what that brings, but also I think the impact on other departments within our organisations, you know, getting up to speed and using things like internal audit, um, are they moving at the same pace or where are we focused on? And I think from that viewpoint that we need to make sure that we're taking everybody with us, but also not lose sight that when you talk about smart devices and capability of these devices, that's experiences for customers. So customers are thinking more about the experience than the transaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. just, I think just to build on that point, I think for me, the technology is, is, is important, but the technology will continue to change. So I think the two key points for us is how do we understand and stay ahead of that technology, but understand what the technology can do to improve that customer experience. Because I think for me that will be the key battleground and the key differentiator for us as financial services, which says, how do we give people that seamless customer experience that they get used to from other providers mm -hmm. like Amazon, like Uber? So it's about understanding the technology, but then quickly applying that technology to banking and that customer mm -hmm. experience. I think that's the crucial mm -hmm. question that I think we all will face mm -hmm. over the next mm -hmm. five years. And, and maybe if I can, Gavin, um, take you back onto the learning development side, because you're almost the opposite of, of yeah. Claire in that you're a reformed banker who's moved into the learning <laughs> and development right. uh, Just uh, about side. Reform. So it's, we're having a kind of therapy group yeah. here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure you must have kind of colleagues from the business kind of be phoning up and saying, oh, voice is the next thing. We need to train everyone in, in, in voice. We need to, you know, how, how are you kind of coping with the demands when people are saying, look, we need, we need this, we need this, we need to build capabilities in X, Y, and Z, whereas actually what the truth is we're not really sure what's going to happen over the next five, ten so I years think, and beyond. Um, I, I think we approach it in three different ways. So first of all, I think you need to help leaders understand how they now lead in this environment where mm -hmm. there is so much uncertainty, there is so much need to collaborate in a different way, work in a different way, even to work in partnership. So you know, there, there is no way that we can be experts on everything. Mm -hmm. So actually, how do you form strategic partnerships with people who do know yeah. this? So I think we have to help our leaders, first of all, understand and have the right skills to, to work in this environment. I think what we then start to focus on is what are those critical skills that, that form the foundation of, of how people will operate in mm -hmm. the, the current climate. So things like critical thinking, things like being connected in collaboration. And then, mm -hmm. you're right Simon, we have to get into that more technical space yeah. and understand what are those technical requirements and, and start to train. I guess we have an approach that says we can lay some bets, mm -hmm. but we also I think have a, a very mature view now which says we might get some of those bets wrong, mm -hmm. but we may also help people um, you know, be, be, be learning for the job that they may have tomorrow or the job mm. that they may not even know that they're going yeah. to get. So actually, how do you manage helping people learn for the job today and the career that they'll have tomorrow and, and, and trying to find that balance? And, and mm. it's, it's not easy, but uh, I think continually just listening to, your, mm. to the market and those partners does help a lot. Mm. But I think there are some kind of core, well, probably core banking skills and core learning skills around that. So maybe I'll bring my colleague Karen from the Institute in, in here. I mean, how can, how can we and other professional bodies and the education sector help with this? I think as a reformed banker and a reformed L&D specialist, so I don't quite know what I am, um, my, my focus is, is always been around the individuals. So I'm, I'm really interested to see um, where individuals will be in terms of supporting customers going forward. So in five years' time, you know, are they going to come IT experts, you know, techn technology experts, because that's what the customers are looking for them to do. And if that is the case, where does edu edu banking education sit? You know, is a, what is a dynamic of how we educate our people from a, being a banking professional going to change? Is a subject matter that we need to qualify them in going to change? So I'm really interested to see how that evolves over the next five years and sits with the customer experience, the development of the individuals uh, and the requirements of the bank. And I think there's an interesting challenge there because actually 
do we need to think about it the, in a, another way around, which says how do you help our IT people become professional bankers? Mm -hmm. Because actually, yeah. the person that may speak to your customers most is not the person in the branch, mm -hmm. but the person who's programming your IBM mm -hmm. Watson yeah. chatbot to speak to many customers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a fascinating angle on it, which says actually how, mm -hmm. how do we reverse engineer things and find um, you know, technologists who want to become bankers? Mm. You've touched on something quite interesting as well, in that there's, there's jobs coming up now that didn't exist before. Um, so, I mean, there is an entire job out there for tone of voice for chatbot. And the tone of voice that you have for a chatbot for a professional a bank like HSBC versus the tone of voice you might have for a consumer company like Apple or, um, you know, a, I don't know, a more reverent company, they're completely different. And it's quite interesting because how do you then evolve your, you know, all your job families and mm. hiring and all of that to account for these unique and different roles? And they also then become quite interesting in the concept of, you know, everything that sits on data, all of the all of the artificial intelligence sits on data. And how do you now get people who are able to, whether it's keep an eye on the algorithms, whether it's understand the underlying data and making sure the things that are going in are correct. There was a, a very interesting story that came out of um, a Norwegian bank where they had applied um, artificial intelligence to decision making process for loans. And what they were finding was that 80% of the loans were going to gentlemen. Um, and when they unpicked what was in the system, there was a checkbox in there for whether or not you had done your military service. And uh -huh. the, the, the system mm. had decided that military service mm. was a good thing. And therefore, and because it was predominantly something that was male, it, it became a proxy mm. for gender. And you know, when you go through it, and find it, you can you can change it and adapt it and, and retrain the system. But it's just quite interesting, how do you make sure you have the right people looking at the right things to spot those mm. things? And so a lot of what we've been doing in some bringing some of these systems online is kind of running in parallel. So we have some parts of our risk organization where we've brought in um, you know, new advanced technological ways of doing things, and we're running this new system and seeing what it's producing. But at the same time, we're still running the system we trust um, and comparing the outputs of the two. Mm. And what you often do is run those things in parallel for a significant period of time with the original system leading, and then you can switch around when you have the confidence that this new system is is doing things a little bit different and better. But the, the skills that you need to find to do that are really, really quite interesting and, and, and an ongoing yeah. conversation. I think. And so a question for, for any of the panelists who want to pick this up, in terms of where you find those, those skills, where do you see the balance uh, between you know, sort of buying in skills, getting sort of new young people in with the, the skills and actually retraining existing colleagues who have lots of very good transferable skills but may not have all the tech skills. Sort of how's that balance kind of playing out? I think it can be quite a challenge, but going back to the point Claire made, I think we can't lose sight of who deals with our customers. I think you've got your front face uh, facing uh, customer uh, advisors who, albeit with all the technologies that come in, their interactions might be as, not as often with customers. However, sometimes we forget that everything we are doing above lands with them. And I think we have to make sure that we take them with us. The first time a customer sometimes will interact with you is when something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And to Claire's point, if they don't have that skill set or able to access that skill set, that's a bad customer experience. Um, Going back to the making sure you've got the right skills, I think it's a challenge in lots of ways because we sometimes don't know what's coming. We don't know what skill set we need. And certainly sometimes you can be in the back foot. Um, but we in Tesco Bank are looking at, well, what, who can we um, internally upskill for certain roles? We're looking at our apprenticeships. What can we do in that space? And also looking at, certainly for uh, PSD2, D2 has been a challenge in that you have a certain skill set and knowledge within the business and you can go out to the market and bring in somebody that's got more relevant skills that you need. But everybody's looking for that person. There's not an infinite uh, amount of people out there doing it. So then what do you do? Do you go to the supplier um, who may be somebody from abroad? Can you, do you go to that extent? But it's the ability to upskill people quick enough to deal with the technologies, but working out as well what should our area of focus be so that we know what skill set. Long way around it. But mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you think, and are we able as a, as a banking industry now to, 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 to <coughs> offer a more compelling proposition to, um, you know, uh, against some of the, you, know, you mentioned Amazon, Uber and people before. Um, are we, you know, a few years ago it was certainly the case that, you know, a lot of people with the technology skills wouldn't consider 
banking. I, I personally think that's starting to change a bit, but I'll be interested in, 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 in some of the views here. I, I think more and more people with, with the technical skills that we're talking about want to come and do good work. Mm. So I think as, an, uh, as, a, as any organisation, I think it's about how do we attract people, not only about how are we going to um, develop them, mm -hmm. but actually how, how is the quality of work and the innovative and forward thinking work that, that they're going to get involved in. So mm. I think how, you know, I totally agree with you, there is a skill shortage, but, but I think what motivates a lot of the, mm. the, the people who are skilled in these areas is not just about... Yeah you know, the, the cash side of things, it's about mm -hmm. what's the organisation I'm going to be working with and what's the type of work I'm going to be doing and how will that help me develop in my career, whether that be the skills that they'll receive um, through formal mm -hmm. development or actually the skills that they'll develop through, you know, doing some, some really cool stuff, if that's the right word mm -hmm. to describe it. Yeah. On that point, I think um, when you look at the contractors that you bring in now, it's more than just money. They're wanting challenged, they're wanting to, sh to show and use the skills they've got. And there's been a slight change, I've noticed in behaviour, that they're now more willing to upskill people in row, which I haven't seen before. <coughs> I'm quite interested in, uh, one of the things you'll, you'll hear in the media is, you know, gosh, there's a huge shortage of data scientists, can't find these people. But uh, and actually, organisations are sometimes very focused on how do we get that PhD level hugely detailed yeah. data scientists, and you don't need 50 of those people to run, to run a team. You need one or two of those, but they need to be supported by people who understand your data and how it works. And a lot of the work in data science is cleansing the data, making sure you're putting, again, going back to that proxy mm -hmm. for gender, looking at it to make sure you're putting the right data in, it's in good shape, you know, and that isn't necessarily what that PhD person is doing while they're setting the context. Um, you know, but how do you take, you, you may have existing people in your organization who have the right skills to be brought to that. So I think it's very interesting looking at, you know, as we move towards this deep focus on, on data and data scientists, how do you take your business analysts, who are probably the people who understand quite well your data landscape and give them the right <coughs> skills to actually transition over. And I think very often we have, we have talented people with the ability to learn and it's getting that right context in place to, to move them into the more relevant roles. I think a build on that is sometimes you don't know the skills and capabilities you have in your organisation. So how good are your HR systems around capturing the skills and capabilities that you already have? Fantastic story last week for me in that um, I work in L&D. Um, we were sought out by a technology graduate uh, who turned out he had a degree in gamification mm -hmm. and learning. But he'd found his way onto yeah. a technology graduate scheme rather than towards mm -hmm. us. So fantastic. We are looking to try and build mm -hmm. that capability. but. There's a 22-year-old lad sitting in Edinburgh who wants to do that work, but is just in their own place. So, yeah. organisationally, we've got a real responsibility, I think, to to look within, and mm -hmm. then, as you say, then think about our strategies. Is it, is it by board or built? Mm -hmm. um, but I think we do, um, at our peril, not look wider to understand what you know. There are so many people who go through secondary education, um, but don't get the career that they want because those opportunities weren't there. But they may well be coming along. Mm -hmm. So, how do we? How do we just? you know, look on our own doorstep, I think is important. Mm -hmm. I think Good. as well to add to that is that when we look at our talent databases, we need to stop looking at our sort of middle to top talent. Mm -hmm. We need to start looking from talent bottom up. There is a huge amount of talent, as you see, graduates just coming out mm -hmm. of uni or people who are coming out of college. Not every child that goes into education <laughs> wants to do a degree. There is a lot of intelligent children out there who want to come into banks uh, and get a career in banking that don't necessarily have a degree and there's nothing wrong with that. I think one of the challenges as well is that the world of banking is changing at such a rapid yeah. pace and no matter what skill sets we're talking about today, no matter what those skill sets are and, and where they'll be, you can guarantee that in six months time the world of banking will change that skill set requirement again. So how do we keep pace with that? How do we keep pace with that as, as banks, as L&D professionals, as professional bodies? It's that rapid pace of change that doesn't seem to be slowing down with banking. That for me is the biggest challenge, so we always stay relevant and on, on time. And I think, Karen, it's almost how do we prepare our people to survive and thrive in that type of Absolutely. environment? Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's almost how do we teach them to fish to find out where to go for that capability build or, or who to speak to. So I think, I think what we can predict is that things will keep changing. So actually, how do we build our propositions around those kind of key skills to help people thrive and then to, as you say, adjust to those different technological changes that, that frankly, not all of us can predict quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. One of the things um, I think we need to start doing is looking from talent from your CSRs on the phone, your customer advisors on the phone, and start looking at that. That's your biggest, well, our biggest population. Um, 
And I think that we should turn the way we look at talent on its head, not just about new people coming in. I think we do need new people coming in. I read an interesting article, I think it was in PwC, that was saying we will need to retrain 60 to 70% of our staff. That's a huge opportunity for existing staff mm -hmm. that weren't developed. I one of the challenges we've got um, in Tesco Bank is on apprenticeships. That's a, a really great opportunity for colleagues. However, we need to burst the myth of what an apprenticeship is for some of the older people uh, in the call centre. Our, we have um, roughly 12% of our staff under 25, age 25. So we've got a huge population of staff there that we can influence and educate, but they need to want to do it. Um, and the opportunity is there to do it. We do find it easier in England and Scotland because of the way the levy works. We'll be coming to that next, <laughs> next panel. Yeah, next panel. My favourite topic, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> Alison's prime to bring that one up later. So. But yeah, I think we do start need to, I think when I was speaking earlier about bringing internal audit and risk departments up to speed, I do think we need to bring our talent um, and capability department up to speed as well and look at and reverse it a little bit. We, I, I was speaking to Colin, I don't know where he is at the moment, but I was speaking to him earlier and I was saying one of the things that we have done is we are not doing our graduate programme at the moment. We are focusing on bringing apprenticeships in. However, there, there is a keenness there to do well and be professional in banking. They all do the Chartered Banker a certificate but we're using a couple of them for reverse mentoring with our directors and they find that a breath of fresh air um, and I think we need to start thinking about how we move up instead of always coming down. I think for me um, all of that is absolutely correct and I think as a, as a an organisation you've got a responsibility to upskill all of your employees no matter how young old etc there are but for me there's always that element of the willingness of the individual and that resistance to change, and I think that resistance to change can be sometimes be a huge blocker, and it's the willingness of the individual to to actually open up to what how the world of their banking is changing now, their career is changing. I mean, I am one of those people that do remember an added machine and use an added machine, but I'm sat here today talking about technology. But my mind has always been open to the fact that the, the, my career evolves and evolves and evolves. And I do think there's an awful lot of resistance out there with some people that have been, no matter what kind of business they're in, uh, that have been in business that for a while. So there's the, in, the, the accountability of the individual to want to change as well, I think, is a mindset that we need to work on. Yeah. And managers play a great role in that Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Right? I was lucky enough early in my career to have a really great manager who sat me down at the start of every year and said, what are your development goals? Those aren't hard enough try harder, make a better goal, and kept me accountable to it throughout the year. So really encouraging me not just to set small boundaries, but actually bigger ones. And as a result, that sort of pushed me to think about things like, okay, what resources are there within the organization I can take advantage of? Mentoring, I was mentoring someone which really turned into, as you said, reverse mentoring. I learned more from helping her yeah. than I think maybe she learned from me, which was fantastic. Um, you know, I think we also have to think about how everybody learns differently, right? Yeah. My, I've, one of my nieces has just been diagnosed dyslexic she's incredibly smart and incredibly inte intelligent but you know book learning and reading is not the way she's going to get her education i'm excited about the potential for virtual reality in you know in the, how that plays out in the next 10 or 15 years in in terms of her learning um you know we had a really interesting model recently you talked about youtube before and people are moving from kind of saying okay i'm going to take a year off and do a full-on degree to kind of what are the small things I can do on an ongoing basis. When I, when I changed from learning and development last year to innovation, it was a huge amount of reading. There's huge resources available online, whether those are you know, things you opt to pay for, like LinkedIn Learning, or, or just you know, reading the vast amounts of information we can get access to. Um, you know, we had an internal program called the Nano Degree that was really interesting. It was based on, um, there were six modules. You would complete each module to move on to the next one. Um, all of the content in the module was what I would call bite-sized. So it might be read this article over here or watch this TED talk, but it added up to a holistic picture of, of whatever that module was trying to convey. But it was really easy to do because if you had 10 minutes on the train home, you could do a bit of it. Um, and it really did enable us to do, uh, it, it was very valuable for me. And one of the components of it I found most interesting was you had to go off and interview a millennial. 
and you were given a script that you had to ask them about their banking and how they interact with things. And it was really interesting that I kind of, I thought of myself as borderline millennial. I act a lot like that. I use my phone all the time. And actually what she does is different from what I do. And just being able to understand that how, how every single person uses in this room uses their phone is probably different. You have different apps. You have different things that you're interested in. Some of you may not touch it at all. Some of you may be on it all day. But just how every individual operates is so different that there's a huge scope of opportunity in there for, for talent and learning. So I, I, I've personally found both of the banking organizations I've worked with to be hugely supportive on that path and, and in helping develop existing colleagues. I mean, there's that old line of, what if you train them and they leave? But what if you don't train them and they stay? And I think... <laughs> <laughs> but but can I just ask another as aspect to that, though, to, to, to the panel? Maybe, Gavin, I'll come to you first on this then. So, so to what extent do you feel that... Um, the, the sort of existing educational infrastructure, whether that's the, the, the universities, the training providers, professional bodies, are supporting your colleagues through, through careers? Because you mentioned developing a, a nano degree there, which is something, I know some universities are moving in that direction, but you're thinking more about a, uh, an edX or a Udemy or somebody like that is, is in that space, and they're sort of disrupting what's happening. So I don't know, Gavin, so I'd put it on the spot a little bit. How, how much support do you feel you're kind of getting from education in general and how much you're having to I, kind of invent yourselves? I, um, I think it's a fascinating question. I, 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 think, I think what education is great at is, is, is giving people those kind of that base knowledge. I think what we then have to think about is how do you give people context. Mm -hmm. So it, it's that piece which says, you know, you can be a great data scientist, but how, how do you then apply that data scientist mm -hmm. skill to um, a mortgage buying process and, and the stuff that's coming mm -hmm. out there, for yeah. example. So I, I, I think education does a, does a good job. But if you think about, for me, where we have our most success, it's through our intern programme. So we bring graduates in a year before, and, and now we are hiring probably more than half of our graduates from that internship right. programme because we get to understand them, we get to look at them, but more importantly, we get to understand their fit of their skills with the context of our mm -hmm. organisation. So I think what education needs to think about is how does it play its part in this, this learning ecosystem that we now have? It can give a lot of credibility, but how do we give people context? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a, an interesting challenge for for education mm -hmm. to, to think about. Yeah. And how do we partner? I, I think it's not an education problem or a business problem. I think the way forward is about a partnership because mm -hmm. we've got lots of context, but maybe not the technical knowledge and yeah. skill that the, the institutes or the um, the universities can give us. So I, I think the way forward is partnership. Mm. And, and also perhaps picking up on the, uh, another aspect that of, of, of the original question. Um, I don't know, was the question prompted in any way by the, the Lloyds announcement earlier in the week about, you know, the, the, the 6,000 jobs going but the 8,000 jobs being created? Was that in your mind when you were asking the question at all? Yeah, so, so, so I'm kind of in, in, intrigued. So, so you know, because obviously we, we, we do hear a, a great deal about um, banks kind of um, downsizing or sort of roles in branches and in contact centres, back offices and things being replaced by, you know, whether it's AI or bots or uh, robotic process um, uh, automation and uh, and so on, but the history of technology tends to show that um, uh, technology ultimately creates more jobs than it destroys. And I think I'm right. So I think it was an EY report out recently um, where they're suggesting that you know on balance, on a I think it's a, a, a ten year perspective, um, that AI will will create more jobs yeah. than it replaces. Was that an EY report, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, what what are your thoughts about? I mean, I mean, do you agree with that that thesis that um, you know, uh, yes, it may be difficult for some current colleagues to get the skills they want, and, and you know, you, you need to, it'll be a shared responsibility for the employer and the employee to get people skilled up. But on a longer term perspective, do do you do you, do, you, do you think basically there's still going to be jobs in banking for people? I think yeah. yes. I think um, CPD plays a huge part in. Um, people learning and wanting to learn and take accountability and I think an element of what Claire was talking about there, CPD, it's taking time out for you to develop and explore what's happening out there and being, equipping yourself to understand in the banking sector um, what is current, what is happening, what are other organisations doing um, and how, how can you make yourself relevant. I think on the school point, um, we, would do, we do work with schools and universities, we do um, lots of different uh, projects with them um, and we had a project we were doing with Edinburgh University where um, 
we were doing, we, it was Edinburgh Festival and we did the DDIP mm -hmm. campaign and test. And it was interesting actually from a colleague's viewpoint, colleagues do want to learn, but they want the time to learn. Mm -hmm. And there is the perception that that time should be in work time. And I think from a, somebody who does do CPD and takes it seriously, a lot of that happens out with work. You do it, you take accountability, you're personal for doing it. And I think we can do a little bit more of that with schools as well. Mm -hmm. And educate um, pupils who are leaving school to think about what they're doing, explore a little bit more than they do. Yeah. I'm quite excited. One of the things that we're seeing is, uh, it, it's not that AI is replacing people, it's that we're bringing in tools that support our colleagues. So rather than any one role being eliminated, there's certain things that are happening that make roles easier. So for example, last year I was on a team that worked to um, deploy optical character recognition in branches in China. Now, optical character recognition is long solved in the UK. You can mm -hmm. scan in a document and it'll be pretty well recognized, but it was a harder problem in Chinese. It's a harder, harder language. And what that meant for frontline staff was if a, if a client in a branch handed in a change of address form, rather than sitting there for five minutes trying to translate it into the system and work it out, they could scan it in and the system would do that and it would give them a prompt saying, I think it's this, have I got it right? Um, so just making people's lives easier so they can spend more time with the customer. So what we're finding is, in, there was a book recently somebody put out called Human Plus Machine, and it really is, it's all about what happens in the plus. Have we given our colleagues the skills to interact with these new tools that make their lives a little bit easier? But to your point of technology creating new jobs, I, I love the example again of watching what happened in the automobile industry. Right? When, when, when cars were first invented, there were some very obvious things that people thought of, of you know, yes, okay, we're gonna need roads, we're gonna need bridges, we're gonna need um, mechanics and engineers um, and petrol stations. But then you start to expand that and, and somebody thought, oh, well, let's make a car wash. Let me make some money out of washing these things. Or you have like the California custom cars where people do crazy things to them. But you know, all of these things are an extension of that technology. Mm. And I'm fascinated to, you know, where will we be 10 years from now when those extensions have sort of played through? I think that would be quite interesting. Yeah, an avatar wash, maybe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>